Today's video asks the question, what exactly is a game? That might sound like a rather stupid question, because after all, we all know that the games that we love and play are, well, games. Uh, we know that Fortnite, Minecraft, Call of Duty, League of Legends, uh, Stardew Valley, Ooblets, all are games. But surprisingly, the question of what is a game and what is not a game is still highly discussed even today. Of course, some of these discussions are rather silly, like the question of if uh, Animal Crossing is a real game because it is not difficult enough. And I definitely don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But still, which attributes exactly make a game? For example, would you say that the things you play in Roblox are games? The developer of Roblox argues that their games are not in fact games, but rather experiences. So what is the difference between a game and an experience? Now, of course, in the Roblox case, one might argue that, well, their discussion probably is not about the philosophical question of what is a game, but probably rather something business related. After all, the question of what makes a game was also discussed during the Epic vs. Apple court case, um, because in the Apple App Store, the guidelines for games and in-app purchases in games is different than for other apps. Now, we probably do not care that much about the guidelines for uh, Fortnite's in-app purchases, but still, it was very interesting to see something like that discussed in a court very recently. Um, and especially the fact that everyone, including the judge, had a different definition of what makes a game is exactly what we would like to discuss today. Now, so far, we mostly looked at how a specific group of players or some companies define games. So our next question would be, do we get a clear picture if we look at what academics have to say? And the answer is, well, mm, yes and no. Even game scholars do not agree on one single definition. And in fact, um, their definitions also greatly vary. However, when looking at a bunch of different definitions, we definitely can narrow it down a little bit. So to do so, I would like to once more refer to the work of Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, who you might know from my previous videos on the Magic Circle. So why did I choose Salen and Zimmerman? Well, in their book, Rules of Play, they created a handy comparison which both illustrates the diversity of different concepts, but also points out the similarities. So how did they create um, this comparison? Um, they looked at eight different takes from eight different people or groups, many of which have a completely different background. So, for example, we have David Parlett, who is a game historian, Roger Galois as a sociologist, um, Bernard Suits, who is a philosopher, and a bunch of game designers. Salen and Zimmerman then looked at different attributes which games have according to these definitions, and um, they then boil it down to 15 distinct elements. Let's quickly go through all of the 15 elements before we then have a closer look. So number one, games proceed according to rules that limit players. Number two, games have conflicts and contests. Number three, games are goal oriented or outcome oriented. Number four, games are an activity, a process or an event. Number five, Games involve decision-making. Number six, 
Games are not serious, but absorbing. Number seven. Games are never associated with material gain. Number eight. Games are artificial, safe, and outside of ordinary life. Number nine. Games create special social groups. Number ten. Games are voluntary. Number eleven. Games are uncertain. Number twelve. Games are make believe or representational. Number thirteen. Games are inefficient. Number fourteen. Games are systems of parts, resources, and tokens. And last but not least, number fifteen. Games are a form of art. Now, 15 elements is quite a lot, so let's see which ones we can skip without a more in-depth discussion because they are easier to understand than others. First, we have rules which govern what players should and should not do and thereby limiting the player's options. Well, I would say yes, this one is pretty straightforward. Next up, games are activities, processes or events. Yeah, also kind of makes sense, right? Uh, usually when people play games, they do something, they act, they react. Uh, otherwise, the game would not be played. So yeah, games are an activity. Uh, the third one, voluntary. I would say that's also quite self-explanatory. Games should be played out of free will, at least according to some authors. Games are uncertain. I would say this one seems a little bit ambiguous at first, but if we make an example, it's quite simple. When we start a game, we do not know how it will end. So for example, we do not know uh, who, which team or which player will win the match or who the boss enemy will be and how we will be able to overcome and defeat that boss enemy. We don't know it yet, it's uncertain. Then, games are make-believe. Yes, games are about imagination. The floor is lava. Well, you know, it's not actually lava, but in the fiction of our game it is. So yeah, makes sense, games are make-believe. Then, system of parts, resources and tokens. Yeah, games often have resources and tokens, yeah, sure. And the last of our easy points is games are a form of art. Now, of course, there is a huge discussion of what art exactly is, um, but if we just take it for granted what art is, then we also kind of understand what somebody means when they say games are a form of art. Okay, so we went through the first seven elements and they are more or less easy to understand, but we still have eight more to go. I'll try to make it as easy to understand as possible, but as you will see, it can get a little bit tricky sometimes. First of our harder um, elements is games have conflicts or contests. So, a lot of the definitions state that games need to have contests, especially the older ones. And if we look at games before we had video games, that also makes a lot of sense. So we're mostly talking about um, card games, board games and sports. Most of these games were multiplayer games and most of them were competitive, so yeah, they are kind of a contest, makes sense. But in the age of video games, other forms of conflict have become more and more prevalent. Conflicts such as battles that need to be fought against computer-controlled enemies, um, overcoming environmental obstacles or dangers, or even a story conflict. And this point is also in direct relation to the next one. A game is goal-oriented or outcome-oriented. So usually if we have contests or conflicts, we 
have them for a reason or we engage in them with a reason. Um, so, for example, we want to win um, the game or we want to kill the boss enemy and beat the game. So, yeah, it definitely makes sense to argue that games are goal-oriented or uh, outcome-oriented. And it is also no surprise that decision-making appears in some of these definitions, because I would argue that from conflict over goals to activities and decisions, we can make a straight line of dependencies, if you will. So if you have a conflict, we usually have a goal on how to resolve it. Um, and to reach that goal, we have to become active, we have to carry out actions. And to choose this action or even to determine our goal, we need to make decisions. The next one is a little bit a different topic. Um, games are not serious, but absorbing. And this aspect is unique to Heisinger. And I'm just directly gonna uh, uh, quote his argument, which is Play is a free activity standing quite consciously outside of ordinary life as being not serious, but at the same time absorbing the player intensely and utterly. So we can see that he emphasizes how games are different from other everyday activities. The next point also is quite similar or it goes into a similar direction. Games are never associated with material gain. So Heisinger and Galwa, who by the way strongly based his take on Heisinger's, think that a game should never be productive. Heisinger and Galwa, however, are not on the same page completely when it comes to this issue. Uh, Heisinger notes that no profit should ever be made in a game, but Galwa thinks that exchange of property among the players is fine. So when we say, we're, let's say we're playing a game of poker and I'm losing a lot of money to you, that would be within the bounds of a game for Galwa, but not for Heisinger. Next, we also have a rather ambiguous point. Games are artificial, safe and outside of ordinary life. So in my previous videos, we discussed the magic circle. And if we look at this from the perspective of the magic circle, it makes sense. Um, games are special, they are in a fictional magic circle with artificially created rules and they are confined from the rest of the world uh, by the bounds of the magic circle. So yeah, so far so good, but what about safety? Because when we were talking about the magic circle, we never talked about safety. Now, this aspect was mostly taken from game designer Chris Crawford's definition. Crawford argues that conflict, one of the points when we discussed earlier, implies danger and danger means risk of harm and, you know, we actually rather not get harmed, right? Um, so therefore, he argues games need to be safe and their artificial depiction of conflict and harm should be a safe way to explore these things. So if you look at Call of Duty or Battlefield, for example, these games depict something very real, war. But through the game, you can, yeah, in a way, experience war and battles in a safe way. Our next and almost last point also is not the easiest one to grasp just by its definition. It states that games are creating special social groups. With this one, Heisinger describes how players distance themselves from the common world, for example through disguise. Um, and an easy example for this could be a sports jersey or actors dressing up for their play. Things that make it clear 
that these people belong to the game and what the role they actually play. So for example, I am a player of this team or I am a fan of this team. This is my social group as opposed to the players and fans of other teams or um, people who don't care about sports at all. Or to make a video game example, I am in the Alliance or the Horde in World of Warcraft or I see myself as a gamer, a member of a gaming community as opposed to non-gamers. Okay, we almost made it, just one more point to go. Games should be inefficient. This is another aspect unique to just one of our authors, and this time philosopher Bernard Suits. At first glance, this might seem very similar to Heisinger's and Galois' point about material gain. But if we look at Suit's text, we realize that he has something completely different in mind. He writes, To play a game is to engage in activity directed towards bringing about a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by rules, where the rules prohibit more efficient in favor of less efficient means, and where such rules are accepted just because they make possible such activity. I also offer the following simpler and, so to speak, more probable version of the above. Playing a game is the voluntary effort to overcome unnecessary obstacles. So Suits thinks that games need to be something in which we create obstacles just for the joy of overcoming them. And that's actually quite interesting, right? So yeah, finally we made it through all the 15 points, we looked at all the 15 elements of what makes a game according to these 8 authors. And it's indeed quite a list. So does a game need to be in line with all of these points to be a game? Or are games that tick more boxes better games? Let's have a look at that in our conclusion. So yeah, in fact, do all games have to feature all of these 15 properties and does having more of these properties make a better game? Well, I would say for both questions, the answer is a very clear no. Um, if we look at Salence and Zimmerman's handy matrix, we notice that there is not even one single point which all of the eight authors agree on uh, not even rules. So, of course, we can see how the concept of games gravitates toward certain characteristics which more of our authors agree upon, uh, such as the just mentioned rules or the notion of games having a goal. And I would also say it's perfectly reasonable to argue that these properties are indeed inherent to most games. But on the other hand, I would also argue that it would be possible for each and every of these 15 points to find an example which would be an exception. To make one example, uh, are all sandbox games goal-oriented? Is there a certain state that needs to be reached and once you reach the state, you reach the end of the game, you beat the game. What would that be in an MMO or in a game like Minecraft or in games that add new content on a regular basis? Uh, does it count as goal-oriented when I play Minecraft and I say I want to make a mushroom house? Is that an, a goal-oriented game? Or to take one other point, uh, let's say uh, productivity and um, uh, uh, material gain. If we have a game like Folded, which specifically was made to help scientists research proteins, or EVE Online's Project Discovery, which is a series of mini-games within EVE Online itself, where players 
in the past discovered exoplanets and were able to do uh, uh, several of these citizen science uh, mini games. Uh, for example, at the moment you can analyze COVID-19 data to help scientists. I mean, of course, yes, it's not material again in a sense of I'm playing this game and poof, there's a cookie or a house that we created through playing the game. But still, it is undeniable that such games are productive and that there is value that is getting generated. So, yeah, if my bold claim is right, and actually none of these points are strictly necessary for a game, what does that mean for us and the question that we're trying to answer in this video? Is it indeed impossible to define what a game is? Well, maybe. But there's also another way to look at this issue. Um, we looked at a range of definitions, some from game developers, some from sociologists or from philosophers, and even some that were as old as Heisinger's, which is from 1938. And we can also clearly see how games and definitions changed a lot during that time span. As a logical consequence, we could say, as long as games are changing, so will the definitions of what games are. Games are ever-changing and evolving. They grow with the advancement of technology. They changed based on the shift in our culture. And they also change based on how we interact with each other. In other words, they always have been and always will be a part, an important part of what it means to be human. Now, when I say like, oh, games are an important part of what it means to be human, that's kind of like probably not a very satisfying conclusion, but maybe we should not see our definitions of what games are as a limitation or a way to judge um, objects and products at least not if we are not in a court and you know like we're uh, fighting about a lot of money um, but maybe we should rather see them as a collection of properties which people appreciate about games. The joy and enlightenment of experiencing a work of art, uh, the possibility of living lives beyond reality and our limitations, the relaxing state of doing something completely unproductive, the thrill of overcoming conflicts and mastering challenges, the freedom to do forbidden things like, I don't know, for example, punching somebody in the face and getting away with it, uh, or even the feeling of relatedness during a shared social activity. So if we look at our question from that perspective, we can also see a little bit of a practical way for us to create games and thinking about how we create games. So which of these qualities and experiences do you want to promote with the game you're creating? Or which ones do you enjoy the most when you're playing a game? So yeah, um, if you were looking for a final answer to the question of what is a game then I'm very sorry I guess I have to disappoint you um, it, I wasn't able to you know make the one definition for games uh, also we just looked at eight different takes so of course there are a lot of different scholars and game developers who discussed that question and I would absolutely be interested in hearing what your favorite definition of video games uh, is. I would also be interested in hearing um, your thoughts on this video which yes admittedly 
is very much on the theoretical and philosophical side of things. Um, of course, there will be future videos which are more focused on practical aspects of creating video games. Um, for example, since we talked about you know, different aspects people like about video games, one of the next videos, if not the next video, will be about player types. So we will talk a lot about um, who likes which aspects of games and how you can create games for a specific target audience. So yeah, uh, I would say with that, um, that's the end of our video today. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully see you in the next one. See you, bye!